course I said back, please, that our discussion sounded so scientific and professional. You guys don't have the foggiest idea what the hell you're talking about, do you? Roy Lee asked. Despite his statements to the contrary, after the mule barn incident, Roy Lee was still with us. Quentin scowled at him, but I laughed at Roy Lee's insight. He was right. We launched again the following weekend. I had wet the potassium nitrate and sugar mix and packed it inside a standard casement. A new member of the BCMA joined us. His name was Billy, a boy in our class who lived up Snake Root Hollow. Other boys occasionally expressed an interest in joining us, but Billy was the first one who took it upon himself to persist in asking. I was glad to have him. Billy was a good runner, which considering the range we hoped to attain, I thought we might need to help us find our rockets. He was also smart, smarter than me, if his grades were any evidence. Billy's dad had been cut off in 1957 but had stuck around by claiming an old shack above where the colored people lived in Snake Root. After his attendance at the BCMA meeting at our house, Mom took one look at what Billy had to wear and stopped him at the door. She drew him aside and then took him to my closet and threw open the door. Billy staggered to Roy Lee's car, weighted down with pants and shirts. Octen sat on the pad and fizzled producing some white smoke and just enough thrust to rock it gently on its fins. We inspected it afterward, a dark, thick liquid like caramel oozing from it. I cured it all week and it was still wet, I told the others. <laughs> Quentin shook his head. I warned you, sugar's too soluble. Aka Levin, which had rocket candy inside that I had not moistened, leapt off the pad with a satisfying hiss but then exploded, steel fragments whistling overhead while we hit the dirt inside the blockhouse. We crept outside and stood around the pad. My speculation is the propellant collapsed, Quentin said. The steel casement was turned back like a banana peel. Quentin expanded on his theory. When the rocket took off, the propellant was so loose, it just fell inward. Too much of it burned at once. The nozzle was probably clogged too, Billy said, which was a decent observation for his first time on the range. We went back and looked at the first rocket. The batter that dripped out had hardened. I dug at it with a stick. There's no way this could fall inward, I said. But that's been melted, Sherman observed. I wonder if it would still burn. To find out, we took a chunk of it to the pad and lit it. It sputtered and then burst into flames. Sherman said what we were all thinking. What if we melted rocket candy before loading it into the casement? For the first time since we began building our rockets, I hesitated. I don't know, boys, I said. That sounds like a prescription for getting our heads blown off. The others stood around me, looking concerned and thoughtful. If we were very careful, Billy began. Melted just a little bit at a time, Sherman added. Look, it's me who would have to do it, I said, and I think it's just going to blow up in my face. We'll help you, Roy Lee said. I'll build us protective masks with shields and everything, Odell said, his eyes wide with the concept of it. No, I said, it would be crazy. We stood around in a circle, kicking at the slack. I still say we do it, Roy Lee said, quietly. What do you think, Quentin, I asked. Quentin shrugged. This one's your call, Sonny. It is a step in the unknown, I'll warrant. But, damn, it would be a fantastic propellant, I'm sure of it. One night, the following week, Roy Lee, Sherman, and I visited Jake's rooftop telescope. NASA had launched the little 38-pound Pioneer 1 to the moon. It was America's first attempt to reach the moon, and we were excited about it. We knew we had no chance of seeing such a tiny object, but we just felt closer to it up on that roof. Pioneer 1 arced through space until 60,000 miles out, not quite one quarter of the way. It lost momentum and dropped back, burning up in the Earth's atmosphere. 
The newspaper called Pioneer One a failure, but it wasn't. Not for us coal miners' sons on top of the Coalwood Clubhouse. When Jake went down the ladder to his room, we stayed on the roof talking about the moon and what it might be like and occasionally peeking at it through the telescope just in case something about it had changed. In fact, it had already changed because we had gone to it in our minds. We had flown the little spacecraft beyond its physical capabilities, zipped past jagged mountains and over the gouges and tiers of primordial bombardment, admired all the moon's craters, its Mars, and its mountains. Someday, I was convinced we would go there. Not just mankind, but us, the boys on that roof. If only we could learn enough and were brave enough. That's why I decided up there on that roof that we would melt saltpeter and sugar.